Hi and welcome to Ovi. You're probably asking yourself, what is Ovi? Ovi is an online platform that allows you to watch a video and participate in a chat by sharing your thoughts and feelings with other members of the audience. It's like a movie theater where you can interact with the community around you. You can share resources, ideas, and even talk to panelists and experts in the chat window. That's because Ovi is about quality video and quality conversation. We all have something to share, and Ovi is a great place to do it. So how does it work? As you're watching something, if you have a feeling you'd like to express, just click the little icons that are down here below the video screen, and you can share your feelings that way. You can also type in your thoughts in the chat section on your right, and during the screening, the moderator may occasionally throw in a couple polling questions. You can participate in those by clicking the link in the chat window. You can even ask your friends to join you in the screening room by clicking the Facebook and Twitter icons below the video screen. Once the screening's over, the moderator usually leaves the chat open for a little bit so you can share any additional thoughts you have. And don't forget to RSVP to an upcoming OV. You can always find listings on our website at ov.itvs.org. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoy this OV screening and let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your feedback. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us this evening and welcome to the Inventing Tomorrow in the Classroom, a webinar hosted by POV and PBS. First and foremost, all of us wanna thank you for joining this webinar this evening. We're so delighted to welcome you um, to this learning opportunity. It's gonna be quite a, a special evening. And we are really looking forward to sharing the award-winning documentary film, Inventing Tomorrow, and the unique, fully accessible and free curriculum and screening materials uh, that have been created to support incorporating the film into your classroom. My name is Fran Sterling, and I, along with um, Assad Muhammad, who I will introduce in a minute, are um, going to be facilitating the webinar this evening. Uh, that shouldn't be going like that. <laughs> um, I am co-founder and partner at Blue Shift Education, and uh, we had the great honor of working with Laura Nix, Director of Inventing Tomorrow and POV in creating the curriculum and the screening materials that we will be looking at this evening. Uh, POV and, PO and PBS are our partners on this webinar, and I want to start by introducing my colleague Assad, who's the Vice President of Impact and Engagement Strategy at POV Engage, and he also wanted to welcome you this evening. So please, Assad, take it away. Thanks so much, Fran. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, as Fran stated, I work for American Documentary POV. American Documentary is a nonprofit arts organization. Uh, we also have POV, our documentary showcase series, the longest running doc series on PBS. Uh, and we are in our 32nd season, which Inventing Tomorrow is in our 32nd season. Uh, we have a community network where we are also able to share documentaries with different teachers, educators, community organizers <laughs> all over the country. So we will tell you a little bit about that network later on. Uh, but for now, please uh, look into POV. Uh, we premiere, we're in season right now, every Monday at 10 o'clock. Check your local listings. Uh, we also have POV Shorts, which will be continuing next month, November 4th, with the short film Water Warriors and POV Spark. We have an interactive department that's bringing VR, AI, AR, and the, all of the interactive uh, tools to public media and to local stations uh, to make sure that we are not leaving libraries and the public behind as it relates to their interactive world. So thank you, Fran. 
Oh, thank you, Assad. It's a real pleasure to be working with POV um, with this film. And as you can also see in the window, there's director Laura Nix, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, who's gonna share some of her insights about making of uh, Inventing Tomorrow. And then we're also going to hear from veteran educator, Catherine Tabor from El Paso, Texas. And, and I don't wanna spoil what Catherine's gonna share, but she has already used Inventing Tomorrow in her classroom and has some really, really, um, I think helpful insights from a veteran educator um, to help us all learn different ways and best practices for bringing inventing tomorrow into your classroom. Um, and one final little introductory comment that I wanna make is the chat box uh, function that you will see. And there are several folks working behind the scenes, um, helping to facilitate this webinar this morning, or this morning, this afternoon. And um, what I wanna emphasize, and I'll remind folks throughout the webinar to be asking questions. We are gonna save uh, question answers to the very end so that we have um, sort of sacred time for Laura and Catherine to engage with all of you. But as questions arise during the webinar, please, please uh, type them in and we'll be collecting them and curating them so that we'll uh, make sure to attend to them uh, later on. Uh, so if there's any, also if there's any technical issues or something that's not working with you, with your OVE, um, just please type that in and, and hopefully folks can uh, attend to that right away. So far, so good. Just a, a, a quick overview, our agenda uh, this evening, um, we have a few goals that we just wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page. As I mentioned, we're going to be introducing the documentary Inventing Tomorrow just in a moment with the trailer. We're gonna hear insights from director and producer Laura Nix, um, which is going to be a real treat. Um, Laura is an extraordinary director and, and just very committed to the education aspect of this film. So uh, it's, it's quite unusual to have this kind of access. So I'm thrilled to have that this evening. We're also going to see um, how to access the resources that are on uh, PBS Learning Media right now and ways to incorporate the film into your classroom. Um, and that's, uh, I, I hope, really exciting for all of you to, to see the the applications right away. Um, and as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, Catherine Tabor from El Paso is gonna be sharing her best practices, then we'll have question answers. And then we have a few next steps and a few celebrations that we can't wait to share with you at the end of the webinar. So for all of us to be excited um, for this, we thought we'd start this webinar with listening and, and watching the trailer uh, for Inventing Tomorrow. So we're gonna move right now to a video piece um, from Inventing Tomorrow. Take it away. You ever throw a rock in and make foam holes? No. Can I? Why would you do that? Whoa. I was always taught by my parents, my grandparents, to always respect the Aina, the land that we live off of. So what, what is your project on? So there was like this factory, but they actually put like arsenic into the pond. Oh, that's mess. You can't even tell there's a lake, it's so overgrown with weeds. When I was growing up, I remember the lake, so nice and clear. People sometimes used to wash the clothes. <laughs> Only that was our problem now. <laughs> One of our students has been selected as a finalist to attend the International Science and Engineering Fair in Los Angeles. How are you doing? Hi. No, I don't do hacks. Oh, that's okay. We can do an arm grasp thing. ¿Cómo se sentiría esa conocer por primera vez Estados Unidos? Bueno, en este momento no me siento emocionado. ¿No te sientes nervioso? Un poco. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This is your time. This is your day. Korea? Oh, I'm from Hawaii. Would you take a photo book with me? Oh, sure. Hemos visto deportistas, las Olimpiadas, dan todo su esfuerzo para representar a nuestro país. Yo también quiero representar a mi país con mi categoría, sería la ciencia. It's inevitably our job as the next generation to tackle this. 
lingkungan itu sangat penting kita mengembalikan kembali lingkungan kasar. Okay. You could combine our products. I could detect it and you could cure it. Yeah. Well, welcome back. We hope that you enjoyed that trailer and there's much more to, to see and to enjoy with Inventing Tomorrow, but that's just to give you a little taste of, of what's ahead uh, later in the webinar. I now would like to uh, transition to a real, um, a real treat this evening, and that's to introduce Director Laura <coughs> Nix, um, who's both the director and producer of Inventing Tomorrow. Um, and before I do that, there were two statements that really, I think, stood out in the trailer to me when I, I rewatched it recently. And it's two things from the uh, two of the students. And I just wanted to uh, iterate them before Laura moves into her discussion, because I think they're very emblematic of, of really the craft of storytelling and, and how Laura was able to capture um, the real, real spirit of these students. And one of the students said, we have seen Olympic athletes represent our country and give everything to represent our country. I want to represent my country, but with science. And another one of the students said, nature is precious and we want to restore it. And I think given all that's going on in our country today, and if any of you from California, we're sending you our good air your way, um, we're, we're very much in that um, idea of preserving that. And so without further ado, um, I'd like to just to give you a brief uh, biography of Laura before I turn over the webinar to her. So Laura is a director, writer, and producer working in nonfiction and fiction. Her most recent work, a short film titled Walk, Run, Cha-Cha, is now streaming on the New York Times Opdocs. Previous to directing the documentary Inventing Tomorrow, she directed The Yes Men Are Revolting on Amazon Prime. And if you haven't seen that, you definitely have to watch that documentary. And The Light in Her Eyes on iTunes. Raised in Western New York State, but now based in Los Angeles, Laura is a film expert for the United States Department American Film Showcase and a member of the documentary branch of the Academy for Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. There's much more to be sharing about director Laura Nix, but um, we'll hold that for another time. And without further ado, Laura, I'd like to introduce you to the webinar this evening. Thank you so much. Um, this is a real gift to me to be able to talk to teachers because um, when I made this film, it was my dream to figure out how we can get the message that's in the movie to both teachers and to classrooms. So um, I wanna thank you for being here. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, myself. I'm a documentary director, as you know, I've been doing this for about 25 years um, plus and um, I was a history major and then I went to art school. I didn't actually study film for people who are interested in how people like me do these kinds of things. Um, I kind of took a indirect path like many of us do. Um, and I also, I think I should share that I was not particularly talented at STEM when I was younger. And uh, so when I first thought about making this film, I was very intimidated by that. Uh, but I do believe that it's possible to kind of explain anything to anybody as long as you think about it long enough. My mom was a um, public high school teacher. I grew up around a teacher and um, I've also taught film myself. And I really believe that if you just ask enough questions about something that's really complicated, you can still communicate that to another person. And um, that was my reasoning for why it was okay for me to make a science film. Um, my, the film that I made before Inventing Tomorrow, The Yes Men Are Revolting, is about climate activism. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how do you take this message about what's happening to our physical world and tell stories about that to people in a way that still keeps people engaged. Because for all of us who have spent a lot of time thinking about the various environmental crises that we face, we know that it's very difficult to be able to leave people with a sense of agency and a sense of hope after you kind of tell people what the facts are. But I think that if we have any hope of creating change, we have to leave people with a sense that there's options and we have to leave people with a sense that you can create change. 
And we have to teach that to young people. So we have to live that as a model. And I also believe that any change is enough as long as you're engaged and you're learning something and you believe that you can do a small thing, that that's something that can create change down the line, that that's a value to teach young people. And that's why I kind of set out to make this film. Um, I was approached about making a documentary about a science fair and I thought maybe that's okay. I'm not sure if I wanna do that film but when I met a bunch of students at the ISA fair who were doing environmental projects, then I knew that I could make this film because I met young people who saw a problem where they were living that was, was scary, but was something that they said, I'm gonna do something about that. They didn't ignore it. We all know what it's like to live in a world where we're facing these problems all over the place and we're kind of taught to ignore things. And, what was really impressive to me when I met these young people at the fair was that they decided not to do that. They decided not to kind of put their blinders on. They decided to stay engaged and aware and, and believe, wait a second, I, that's wrong. I want to be able to change that. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that using STEM. So when I realized that that was a framing for the film that could work, um, then we set about figuring out how we were going to make this very complicated film. The film is shot in Mexico, India, United States, and Indonesia. Um, I traveled to all those places to um, film all the students. We interviewed over 100 students um, to decide who we would cast in the film as the subjects of the film. And when I started speaking to students, I was really looking for a couple things. I, I was looking for students who um, had already qualified to go to ISAF and whose project was ready to kind of stand the light of a documentary that it could um, kind of was strong enough. Not that I needed a winning project, but I just needed to know that the science was strong enough for us to be able to look at it long enough and, and have it um, be able to stand on its own feet. And um, I was really looking for students who had a personal attachment to the problem that they were looking at, because I think that in mainstream culture, there's this idea sometimes that science is really abstract and that science is beyond us and science is done by those people, those geniuses over there. And, you know, my journey making this film was that as a, as a non-scientist, that if I ask enough questions, I really can learn about something that's super complicated. And that's what I saw these students do. These students are incredibly bright. Some of them are the brightest, some of them aren't. Some of them are actually, I, I wouldn't, I'd say that they're average above average, but the point is that they work really hard. And, and I wanted to also show that model of, I'm gonna look at a problem, I'm gonna believe that I can do something about it. I'm gonna work really hard at that. And then I'm gonna make something happen. And I think that that's a model that all of us can, can learn from. Um, so I, you know, we, we talked to students about that sometimes with the translator so I could understand what the issue was where they were living and how their science project was addressing that. And we also needed to make sure that the students' families were okay with us filming, that they would let us in their school. I had to explain that I wasn't just there to shoot the science project on the day of, that I really wanted to understand who they were as people and that we wanted to spend time in their family, in their culture. And you'll see when you watch the film that many of the students are coming from really different places around the world, but you'll see sameness. And I think that that's another unifying factor in, in when you're watching the movie, that there's a story that you're seeing very specific cultural differences, but you're also understanding and witnessing how much we share as humans on this planet, as, 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 uh, as members of this, of this world, that we are able to reach across, you know, such huge spatial divides and, and also through cultural differences, through economic differences, through racial differences, and share something um, with each other that is really a message of believing that, kind of what you said earlier, Fran, believing that nature is beautiful and we can restore it. That was really one of the main messages that we wanted to be able to get across, is that we live in a very fragile ecosphere, that ecosphere is being threatened, 
And yet there's things that we can do to, um, to change that. Um, one thing I always like to mention about the film, some people say, oh, you made a climate change film. And I'm always quick to correct that because the film is really looking at a variety of environmental questions and not just climate. And there's many reasons that we did that. Um, there's some communities that if you start talking about climate change, the conversation is just gonna shut down. And, and I think that it's really important that we also recognize that some of the issues that we're facing, particularly around uh, water safety and safe drinking water are all gonna be happening before the larger climate change issues start to impact us. Of course, that depends on where you live. But it's also easier sometimes to get people thinking about environmental sustainability by talking about issues of clean water and clean air because everybody understands that on a very visceral level that we need to be able to breathe clean air. We have to be able to drink clean water today in order to survive today. Mm -hmm. And the film is told from that perspective so that we can immediately kind of onboard younger people into a conversation about, are those things safe for you where you live? Do you have access to clean air or clean water? Do you have access to clean soil, et cetera? And um, we really wanted to make sure that we were able to show students in process. Science is not, it's not a sport. It takes a lot of time. You have to make mistakes. I relate to it a lot as an artist because our process is also failure, 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 failure. Oh wait, something good happened. And I think that when you're doing a science experiment, you, you see that too. So we wanted to make sure that we included that process to the students. It's, uh, in the film so that everybody's able to watch that. And our film, our students are, are definitely oriented and excited about going to a science fair, but that is not the point for them. They're doing this for a greater reason. They're, they're not just trying to win a prize for, at a science competition. They are fighting for their home. They're fighting for their survival where they live. And that to me is so much greater than whether or not they win the, the prize at the fair. And um, You'll have to watch the film to find out if any of the students do win a prize at the fair, but it was really important to me that the competition was not the central part of the narrative. It's really about the importance of becoming a critical thinker, about asking the right questions about where you live and what the world is like around you and being willing to speak up and do something about it if you see something wrong. That was really the main message that we wanted to get across. Um, I'm going to be looking forward to having a chat with you afterwards. We can, there's a lot of different things that we can discuss, but um, I guess the last thing I just want to leave you with is that I really believe that what we can do in this generation is teach a different set of values to young people about how we as humans need to interact with the ecosphere. Science is one way to do that, but we also have to remember that in some ways science is what got us here. That's what brought us the combustible mm -hmm. engine. That's what brought us plastic. That's what brought us the atom bomb. So we're capable of inventing great things and doing great things with technology. However, technology can also be used in a destructive fashion. So um, I'm really hoping that what we're able to do with the lesson plans and all the rest of the programs that we have is to orient students toward a different way of thinking mm -hmm. about how we can use this technology to create a sustainable world. Mm. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I know that um, seeing you in, in several venues present with some of the students as well has been a real treat um, through this process. And I was fortunate at the National Science Teachers Association um, conference this past year uh, to have a packed house of teachers just giving you a standing ovation and in tears with how much they felt um, that this film spoke to their students, students of, of, of all socioeconomic backgrounds, of all languages, of all ethnic backgrounds, of all genders. And I think the idea of sparking that real fire of science and everybody can do science um, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more from Catherine as well, but I, I just remember some of those teachers so emotional about it and it just has really stayed with me. So thank you so much. You. Um, and I know folks are conversing a bit on chat now with questions, but I wanna just pause just for a, a few seconds. And if there's things that Laura mentioned just now, or if you have a question that you wanna make sure you are able to um, get answered by the end of the webinar, please take a moment and type in your questions now or as they arise, but at least we'll have them written down now because Laura shared 
um, a lot. And um, I think it's just a, a good sometimes moment to, to pause. Um, also, um, which uh, I was remiss in forgetting to ask at the beginning of the webinar, if you have seen the film already or used it in your classroom, would you just take a moment and type that in the chat as well um, so that we can see how many have heard of the film, how many have seen the film, how many seen the film at a conference, just for us to, to have a lay of the land as, as we move forward in the webinar. That would just be really fantastic. So as folks uh, get their questions, fielded into the chat. Um, we're going to now transition to actual looking at um, the curriculum and the resources that were developed um, in, in cooperation with Laura's team and also with uh, POV. And as you see now on the slide, they are hosted on PBS Learning Media. And I'm sure many, many of you are already uh, signed in uh, to this free resource. And if you're not, I encourage you to sign up for PBS Learning Media. There's a wealth of information here. But when you go to um, the Inventing Tomorrow um, uh, page on PBS Learning Media, this is what you're going to see. You'll see this um, slide. And what I'm going to do here, just for the OVE folks behind, I'm going to switch over to live website, if that's OK. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this screen. I have it all loaded here. And it's going to look like this. I'm not going to. It's actually this one I want. Is that OK? Um, if everybody can see. So you should be seeing now it says lesson plan clip to air. Is that what folks are seeing? Great. Um, thank you for that feedback. Um, it's easier for me to manipulate it in a live screen. Um, there are um, four lessons that were developed for Inventing Tomorrow. Um, the first one is you come here, you see Jared, and the lesson um, with his project is titled Soil, Understanding Soil as Filter. And what Jared really investigates and what he presents as ISIS, at ISIF is the arsenic that was a result of early tsunamis that happened in his uh, home of Hawaii. And so he has his experiment and this is him speaking with his mentor. I'm not gonna click on the video, um, but I'm just gonna walk you through what each of the lessons are for you to get a sense of the scope. You saw a few of them in the trailer, but really they're much more in depth. Um, so this is Jared um, soil lesson. And again, the documentary film is really there to set the foundation for each of these lessons to be incorporated into uh, a myriad of science courses, environmental science, earth science, life science. Um, if you do science fairs or the ISIS fair itself, these are of course wonderful bottles. Catherine's gonna talk about how she integrates it into her physics class in a moment. So there's lots of different uh, ways of doing this. So this is uh, the soil lesson. Uh, the next one is um, Fernando, Jesus, and Jose, who lived in Monterrey, Mexico, as Laura mentioned. And they, uh, we're going to talk about them a little bit more with Catherine's, but uh, their lesson is titled Air Innovations to Clean Out Their Air. And um, they develop a, a, a paint that uh, is a, can absorb the pollution from the air. And, and, uh, but their story is, is that and much more. Um, and I'll let Catherine talk about that. But their lesson is specific about air and innovations to clean out air. The next lesson is um, one on oceans and mitigating industrial pollution. And this is uh, Nuha and Intan live in uh, an island of Indonesia called Bangka, which is the world's second largest source of tin ore. And this lesson in particular will definitely grab the attention of your students because they talk a lot about how the essential um, ingredient of cell phones and many of our electronics is tin. And we see firsthand where this tin comes from and how it's infecting her island and, and the socioeconomic, but also the environmental factors of her island. So this one in particular um, has some real world, I think, connections with students today. And it looks at mitigating industrial pollution and oceans and tin. The next lesson is water. Um, and this is a citizen scientist effort um, to look at uh, Sahithi and clean water in um, uh, natural bodies of water. And she um, develops an amazing citizen science project about collecting the pollutants that in, are in her um, 
community in India. And this is her lesson on water citizen science, its efforts in that way. And the last lesson that's on this screen that you see here is actually the culminating clip uh, of the film, um, but it's the students at the ISAF fair and as they present and defend their data. And this is sort of the culminating um, unit um, or culminating clip of the film. Now, when we um, developed the curriculum, um, Blue Shift working with Laura's team, we wanted to really make this an accessible, flexible curriculum for many, many disciplines to use in the sciences. Um, and also in the storytelling in English language arts, you can certainly do some interdisciplinary work as well. So on this PBS Learning Media site, you see here there is the full curriculum in a PDF form um, that will come up. And it's, um, as you see here, a document that you can download completely printed out. Um, there's the table of contents. Um, and you can certainly do one lesson at a time or all the lessons um, in, in a sequence, or they can be standalone lessons. We certainly recommend viewing the full film and Laura's gonna speak a little bit about uh, at the end about how to access the film, but it's, it's most beneficial if you can view the whole film, there's a 55 minute and a longer version, um, and then use these lessons. Um, but these certainly can be interspersed throughout your curricular uh, unit in that sort of way. Um, so that is the curricular guide. And then there's also a screening guide. I'm not gonna click on that, um, but you can see where that's located. Also on the PBS Learning Media site is the standards, um, uh, the NGSS standards that are met by this curriculum. So this is also something helpful that I know many of you need to have on hand and ready um, in case uh, questions are asked or how you want to um, bring that into meeting the standards in your classroom. So um, I'm gonna pause there if there's any questions about the curriculum or how to access that, certainly put that in the chat and we'll address that at the end. I'm gonna look at my notes here to make sure. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention, I, I've, I've said a few times about the interdisciplinary stuff. We were also particularly interested in the international flavor of these students and, and really the, the backyard uh, experience that they have of bringing the science and the experience of, of collecting data and doing research in their own communities, very much part of how we want to empower students to look around, just around where they live and to identify the issues that they can do. So, that, uh, so issues of geography, current events, global studies, all of those things around both environmental science and climate justice uh, and climate issues can certainly bring, bring, uh, be brought in as well. Um, I think for now, I'm gonna pause on um, giving more of the tour so you get a sense of the overview. Catherine's gonna dive into the air lesson in particular in a moment. And then to set up the stage for the air lesson, we thought we'd show you the clip that has been segmented that you can only access on, the, on this website, the PBS Learning Media. Um, and again, uh, as I said, we recommend viewing the whole films, but these little chapters, these little five to seven minute clips are great refreshers for you to bring in after you view the clip or if you focus uh, on a specific environment issue of soil, water, oceans, um, uh, and such. So we're gonna now turn to watching the air clip that can be accessed on the PBS Learning Media now. Ahí en la, en la preparatoria, cuando tomamos el camión, nosotros vemos que el ¡Pum! Te dan el flachazo de smog, de diesel quemado. En Monterrey hay muchos problemas con la contaminación del aire. 
Pero otra de las cosas que más me marcó fue cuando uno de mis tíos murió a causa de una enfermedad respiratoria. Monterrey es una de las ciudades con más industrias en México. Hay demasiada actividad industrial, que pues simplemente no se puede parar. Lo que nosotros buscamos resolver fue el decrecimiento de contaminantes más fuertes que hay en el aire. Se regula un poco, más o menos un, unos 30. Nuestra hipótesis fue que por medio de una pintura fotocatalítica se podían de crecimiento de, de los dos contaminantes, NO2 y SO2. ¿Con este? Más o menos. Dióxido de titanio se utiliza normalmente en las pinturas. Pero nosotros le agregamos estas propiedades fotocatalíticas. Cuando está en contacto con el sol, los contaminantes se transforman en productos inocuos. Entonces, de probar nuestra pintura, pues nos dimos cuenta de que daba una capa de residuo o es soluble en el agua. Cuando llueve se pueden ir esa película que se forma, caen al suelo y las plantas las utilizan como nutrientes. Es un ciclo. Es algo equivalente a sembrar árboles. Vamos a sembrar árboles para eliminar un contaminante que es el CO2. Bueno, pues vamos a pintar muchas casas para que actúen también como arbolitos que están eliminando la contaminación. Exacto, si no podemos detener las actividades industriales, al menos podemos dar alternativas para poder ayudar al ambiente. Creo que la competencia haría un gran cambio en nuestras vidas. Nos daríamos cuenta de que algo que nosotros comenzamos con muy poco podría llegar a, a reconocerse. Ahí nos daríamos cuenta de que estamos haciendo algo bien. Hemos visto deportistas en las Olimpiadas dan todo su esfuerzo para representar a nuestro país. Yo también quiero representar a mi país, pero mi categoría sería la ciencia. Well, welcome back. Um, that is, uh, if that's just a taste of the film, if you haven't seen it yet, um, I hope now uh, after seeing the trailer and seeing those, those beautiful young men and scientists uh, that you'll be sure to go back and watch the full film now. Um, their project is, is quite extraordinary as is their story. Uh, so thank you all um, for watching that. And now it's, it's really my great pleasure uh, to introduce Catherine uh, Tabor from El Paso, Texas. Um, Catherine, I've met uh, mostly online, actually exclusively online. And we reached out to the network of folks that had been in communication with Laura and the team at Adventing Tomorrow about teachers who were just, had seen it at NSTA or had seen it in other venues. And we were just 
just really wanting to bring some more feedback in uh, to this loop and, and Catherine just, um, you know, step forward and said, I, I would love to, to be part of the conversations about using this film. So let me introduce um, my friend from afar, Catherine. Catherine <coughs> is a 20 year veteran educator who holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics and physics, a master's degree in physics, and is also currently working towards her PhD in computer science. So you can see why this film is certainly of interest. She is certified to teach mathematics, science, physics, and computer science. And over the years, she's taught at all levels of secondary math, regular IB, AP, pre-AP, as well as computer science, physics, astronomy, and chemistry. Currently, she's teaching AP Physics 1 and AP Computer Science at Northwest Early College High School in El Paso, Texas. And Catherine's going to share a little bit about her school, um, her students, and also how she's used Inventing Tomorrow this semester um, and give you that background as well. So again, remind you as you have questions or thoughts uh, that you'd like Laura and Catherine to field at the end, feel free to add those. Um, and without further ado, please, Catherine. Oh, one thing is Catherine's only going to be on audio uh, because she is at school. And the, as everybody knows, bandwidth at school can be a little temperamental. So she's just going to be on audio. But she does have several uh, slides to share of student work done in the classroom. And Catherine, you just prop me to move forward in the slide, which I see I haven't done yet here. And um, I will just advance the slides as you as you want. So here is Catherine and a picture of her school. Thank you. Go ahead, Catherine. Thank you, Fran. Um, I, as Fran said, I work at Northwest Early College High School in El Paso, Texas. Um, we are a very small school. We have about close to 400 students and um, we are a majority minority campus. And so the majority of my students, about 87% of my students are Hispanic. Um, we also are a majority female campus, about 67% of our students are female. Um, I learned about Inventing Tomorrow. It was kind of an interesting story. I had science, the Science News Magazine. I had applied years earlier to get the Science News Magazine for my classroom. And the Science News Magazine had an article talking about inventing tomorrow and it had a review of it and the review was so interesting that I decided um, that uh, I decided that um, I would go ahead and look it up and that's when I got my copy of inventing tomorrow now last year I really did not have the time to mm. really go into the um, the curriculum or anything like that, and so last year I just used the movie as um, just that, and and a movie where I could show it to the kids and we could just have a, a little bit of a discussion about what was going on. But they were so impressed by it that I decided this year I was going to use it with my freshman students, and so we teach a course in Texas called um, IPC which is integrated physics and chemistry. And I teach the physics half of that. And I decided I was gonna use this with my physics students. And so literally the first thing we did was that we went ahead and I showed the, the 55 minute version of the, the movie um, as the second thing they did for class. And the, um, and, and then my plan is that towards the end of the semester, we're going to watch the video again. And we're going to bookend the learning for that video. And we're specifically bookending the air because being as my campus is majority minority, my students were most interested in the boys from Monterrey and what they had done and the fact that those were students who looked like them and they were making such a huge difference with their paint. Um, and so what we did was we went ahead and we looked at the, um, the first thing, which is the KWL chart. And that KWL chart that um, 
and they, they had to go in and they were given a KWL chart and they, they put down what they knew about air pollution. That's two student examples. That's actual student work from my classroom. Um, they said what they knew and what they wanted to know. That's what we started with. And then I asked them to do research on some air pollution. And I asked them to go ahead and also look at um, the air quality index, which is another one of the activities that is listed in the activity guide is for them to do some research on air quality index. And so they looked at air quality index and um, they looked at it for city, city, for our city, of course, and then for other cities around the world. And they were actually very shocked at which cities were cleaner and which cities were not as clean. And after their research on air pollution, I went ahead and I did have the students um, create some really kind of cool looking posters that um, this, this was one of the posters that they cleaned. It's an alternative clean energy sources. And so they did research on air pollution and then they did research. They decided that the way that they were going to solve the air pollution problem and they were going to help with that is they are going to do, they are going to look at clean, alternative clean energy sources. And so this one is the, has solar energy, wind energy and hydro energy. And it's, it was very exciting for them and, and they were doing all this. And so then we had to get back to physics. And so I said, don't worry, because in physics, we have to learn how to, one of the things that we learn in physics is we learn about how to build simple machines. And so as we go more toward the end of the semester, we're actually starting simple machines in about a week. And once we finish simple machines, the students are going to go back to their alternative clean energy sources, and they're going to try and build a miniature prototype using the concepts of simple machines to have this to for a clean energy source. And so in that way, I'm able to bookend this. Now, what did I, what was I able to do? I was able to leverage their research mm. um, and, and get those skills out of them that um, a lot of times I think are neglected, especially in first year physics courses and first year science courses in high school. Um, we also talked very, we talked a lot about things that were problems in El Paso, like having arsenic in the ground. Um, we had a sarco plants here, which are copper smelters. And one of the byproducts of copper smelting is arsenic. Well, most of El Paso's water comes from groundwater. And so the arsenic in the water is kind of another issue that made, that definitely made them mm. uh, made that made the kids think, um, and then of course because we do have a, a lot of girls at our school, the girls in STEM was one more thing that they were really very very interested in. So these were all of the things that that I am trying to use the video to leverage, and so while it looks from the outside like you know, you would need to do this in an environmental science class, or you would need to maybe do a chemistry class. I think as long as you're trying, as you're willing to think outside the box, you can apply this to a lot of different areas and mm -hmm. you can really inspire these kids to do science. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of my kids are really inspired now to do science. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, Catherine. Have you participated in, in sort of the, the ICEF-like uh, competitions, whether locally or nationally or internationally? We actually, I know, um, I know um, I'm going to give a little shout out. I know Joseph Sapien is on the, on the webinar right now. And um, he actually has a foundation here in El Paso, the STTE Foundation, and he does STEM competitions for local STEM competitions. Because remember, El Paso, very large city, we're also extremely landlocked. And mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have a lot of big cities that, we can, that are nearby us that we can compete with. And so yeah. we have to do a lot of our stuff internally. But Joseph um, does hold competitions for my kids and my kids compete every year. And, you know, I, 
That's great. That's they great. do well. <laughs> Good. That's great to hear. Yes, he had a little shout out for you earlier in the chat as well, since that you're one of the best teachers in the in the world, as amongst other things. Um, well, thank you so much. And I think teachers are starting to, to pepper the chat with some questions. So I'm going to um, leave the, the time for sort of to, to return to the questions, both to you and Catherine and to, and to Laura. So I'm just going to have this slide up and um, I'm going to start uh, with a very local question, Laura. This one goes to you, where somebody who is um, um, wondering if you would return to your roots in Western New York and looking at the problem with flooding or other um, U.S. based problems around the Great Lakes or other things, as, as she mentions, the implementation of Plan 2014. But really, what are what are some of your uh, ideas about returning uh, to Western New York or other environmental issues that you are um, considering doing other films on? Um, I am not con I'm not going back to Western New York for that issue, but I am working on a film in Western New York that's about um, the end of photography, um, analog photography in relation to Kodak. Cause I grew up in Rochester, New York and um, I'm looking at, at, at its impact on the creation and access of personal memories and how mm. we used to take pictures and how we are now. Um, but I'm always interested in other films that have to do with environmental issues but not specifically planned 2014 but I know about it and I've seen it firsthand when I go home to visit my parents. So thanks for that mm. question. That's great. Um, I think this, this next question can either go to Catherine or Laura, but let's start with Catherine. And, and Joy has um, said that she also has used um, the film in her classroom already. Um, she used a clip for a unit around scientific methods and identifying problems and solutions using the SDGs and WEF Global Risk Report. Um, for her lesson, it was about data collection and questions. And so, uh, you know, Catherine first and then Laura um, next. What other ways that can you imagine or would you like um, science teachers to be using uh, like the scientific method or what are some of the challenges that uh, you are encountering with some of the students uh, and that maybe these stories can help alleviate that with, with some of your, your student researchers? I think that the, the biggest um, problem that I have is that the students are often so afraid to be wrong that they're afraid to even try because mm. they're afraid that if they, if they try, they're going to do it wrong and they're going to get the wrong answer. And so convincing them that there's no such thing as a wrong answer, that, mm. a, that the, there's just answers. Mm -hmm. And if those answers lead us to a different conclusion than what we thought we've still learned something from that. Mm -hmm. And so as far as utilizing the scientific method and even just looking at all of those stories, because when you look at all of the stories of all of those students, they did not, they were not right on their first try and they didn't even try to pretend that they were. Mm -hmm. You know, they made lots of mistakes. They talked about the mistakes that they made and it, it was, it's important that the kids understand that science is not about being right. Mm. Science is about learning new things. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Catherine, thank you so much for that comment. I just wanna add something onto that. I think that there's also a lot of pressure for students to prove that they can fix something. And I saw that a lot when, cause I've toured the film a great deal around schools and I've shown it to high schools and middle schools many, many times. And sometimes the students say, well, the only projects that mattered were the ones where they were trying to solve it. And so they were really focused on the paint project and the project in Indonesia and less interested in the projects that had to do with data collection. And something that I've always talked about with students is that it's really important to understand what the problem is in order to know how to fix it. And that's also a part of this process that we have to mm -hmm. encourage a study of what's happening and not just expect some kind of miracle cure. I think our culture is really interested in miracle cures. Mm -hmm. These are really long standing complex problems. And we have to be patient and know that there's a process to get there. And science is one of the best ways to engage in that process. Yeah, yeah. And I think with, with, that, um, with that spirit, we're going to 
to move to next steps, looking at the time that we have, because we have some wonderful news to be sharing. And Laura, maybe it, it, before you transition, if you could give a quick update to where each of the students are in their lives right now, as much as you know, and then we're gonna move to uh, next steps and, and how to access the film. Some exciting news about Sahithi today that came out that Laura's gonna share, and um, we'll just move to that direction. So if let's, while I have this slide up with their wonderful, beautiful pictures up, um, please give us a little bit of an update where they all are right now. Absolutely. So um, Nuha just got back from Oslo, Norway, where she was um, presenting the film and her re most recent research. She is in her second year of university and she's been traveling all over the world to different entrepreneur conferences where she's talking about water safety in relation to the issues of her hometown of Banca. Um, Jose, Jesus, and Fernando are all in their second year of university and they're all doing really well. And they're all still in school and they're getting great grades and they're, you know, they're just pursuing their education. Um, Jose is studying engineering, Jesus is studying marketing, and Fernando is in medical school. Intan is also in medical school in Indonesia, and Jared just started his freshman year at Hilo High School. Sahiti is uh, pursuing her second year at um, Stanford this fall, and we just found, today's Sahiti's birthday, and Yay. we also just found out that she has been named um, Teen Vogue's 21 under 21. So 21 girls who are creating incredible change around the world. And you can check that out online if you go to Teen Vogue 21 under 21. And we're really thrilled for that. Great, that's wonderful, Laura. And there is one last question before we go to next steps. Um, have you been in conversation with ISAF and have they been responsive to the film and how are they embracing the film um, as, a, as a tool for their own work? Um, we've shown the film at ISIF actually twice. And um, I, I mean, I'm open to having us do it every year because I think that to me, one of the greatest things about the science fair is it shows the importance of science communication. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you see it actually, the, um, how the students who are better at telling a story about their project, else it really impacts their, um, their results at the fair. So mm -hmm. I think that they, they know this. They also are very engaged in a lot of, um, issues about diversifying who gets to go to ISEF because it's not a level playing field there. I think that they're aware of that, but they, they also know that there's a lot more work to do. Mm. And um, we're partnering with them on the next phase of our impact campaign as well. I just want to briefly mention that we have a grant that makes it possible for any classroom in the country to be able to get a free copy of the DVD. So if you go to our website or if you go to PBS Learning Media or if you go to POV, but our website's pretty easy. If you go to Educational Toolkits, it's inventingtomorrowmovie.com is our website. And there's a page, Educational Toolkits. And you can order a free copy of the film for your classroom. And please tell all your uh, friends and colleagues to do mm -hmm. the same. And you can also get our free lesson plans where you can download them. You can get a screening guide and you can also sign up for the citizen science challenge that Sahiti has started where students all over the country are gonna be testing their drinking water in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, that's in beta phase right now, but if you sign up, you can stay in touch with us. And we're gonna be rolling this out all across the country and hopefully we'll be doing more internationally as we get the film translated into Spanish. That's the, one of the other things we're gonna be doing this year. Great, thank you. So, um, inventingtomorrowmovie.com um, and please go there. And before we sign off, I'd like to turn it back to Assad um, and give some of our final words um, from our host with POV. Yeah, so thank you so much everyone for tuning in. Uh, before you go, I just wanted to highlight the POV community network. So you see that you can get Inventing Tomorrow from the Inventing Tomorrow website. And if you are interested in other documentaries um, on different themes from immigration, LGBTQ issues, uh, aging, uh, we have, we cover so many topics. We have over 200 films that we lend out to different educators and different partners. So if you go log on to communitynetwork.amdoc.org, you can get it. Again, uh, communitynetwork.amdoc.org and you can sign up to 
get free DVDs sent to you, as well as access all of our educational materials, lesson plans, reading lists, discussion guides. So thank you Wonderful. all so much. Wonderful. So um, thank you again all for sharing your, your time with us, for your spirit and your commitment to teaching students and to bringing these crucial stories um, uh, of our world and pres preserving the nature and the beauty that we have around us. Uh, we had people from all over the country joining us this evening. And if folks, um, if there's any questions that you still have lingering, uh, please uh, fill in the chat and, and Laura and, and Catherine can stay on for a few more minutes. But otherwise I know you've had a long day of teaching. I'm here in Denver, Colorado and we've had a huge snowstorm. So um, life is, is, is uh, always, Always, you never know what happens every day. So thank you so much for taking the time to join POV, um, ourselves at Blue Shift Education, and also Director Laura Nix and Catherine Haber from uh, El Paso, Texas. And until next time, um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.